Hopefully it's there. Now it's there. Good morning, church. Try it again. (laughs) It's a joy to be with you today to celebrate this day of worship. We are Wellspring. We are the place where all are welcome, all are accepted, all means all. And that includes those, both those worshiping here and those who are worshiping with us online. If you're wor- worshiping with us online, we encourage you to click the See More button. And that opens up a box that lets you have access to a number of links, including the uh, order of worship for today, the, uh, the link to register your attendance, to make your gifts. Everything is there. It also links you to the e-news, which is really important for when we get to our announcements. That's where the details are. And uh, for those worshiping in person here, we invite you to take the blue cards and uh, register your attendance on those blue cards. Or if you use Shelby next, then you can do that. Uh, You also have uh, on the back of your bulletin a way to get to e-news. If you're not um, if you're not subscribed to e-news, that is the best place to get all of our information. And so uh, we have some announcements that we want to share. First, I will share uh, because I'm, I'm leaving pretty soon after the service. I'm going to be in confirmation class this morning with our new confirmands. And, uh, but, but I know people will be wondering, yes, I had an encounter with a dermatologist. So <laughs> that's, all, that's all I have to say. So um, the, uh, the, I want to share some of the information that, uh, that you have in e-news. So, uh, ushering, we're still looking for ushers. So again, if you are willing to serve as an usher and have not already signed up, you can raise a hand. We have cards that we're going to hand out. Anybody? Anybody? All right. I don't see any takers. I think all have been signed up that, that are signing up out of this group. So uh, we also have um, the, uh, the tenor bass chorus is, is starting for all who are interested meeting on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock, and so that's something that's really exciting. And then we have United Methodist Men will be meeting this Saturday, and it's an opportunity for all the men in the church to come together and, and, uh, and, and share in breakfast and fellowship together. So, uh, friends, we come as people who worship. Let's stand and join together in our call to worship. Good morning. It's wonderful to see all the bright and shiny faces and praise God for the rain. Let's join together on the call to worship. Happy are we when our treasures cannot be quantified. Happy are we when our knowledge is tempered by mystery. Happy are we when our pain is held in the balm of love. Happy are we when our delight comes from beyond ourselves. Now let us sing.
Our first scripture this morning comes from the Old Testament, the book of Micah, chapter 6, 1 through 8. Here the Lord is calling his sinful people into the witness stand and calling on the mountains to serve as the jury. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the case of the Lord and your enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me, for I was brought brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent you before to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, of son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shechem to Gilgad, that you may know that the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with the thousand rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justice and to show kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise God. Good morning, church. My name is Andy, and I'm here to bring you today's Kids Minute. So I want to ask our big kids in this room, since we can interact with each other, and that's y'all too, choir. (laughs) Growing up, what was your favorite TV show or movie? You can shout it out. What's that? Sesame Sesame Street, Mighty Mouse. Lassie. 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 Oh, Superman. I like that one. I like Superman, too. There's something special about Superman, isn't, isn't there? Not just any old man, a Superman. Meaning what? What was so special about Superman? He could fly. He could shoot lasers. It never seemed like he was in trouble when he was battling anybody. He was always in control. And he always, always won. Well, in the passage that we heard today... From Micah, part of it says we're supposed to walk humbly with God. What does that mean to you? What does the word humble mean to you? Again, you can shout it out. Humus. Humus. And what does humus mean? (laughs) Dirt. Not Not full of yourself. Yeah. So a lot of times in church, we talk about how special we are, and that's true. We talk about how much God loves us, and that's true. But we're also supposed to walk humbly with God. So that's kind of something interesting. Well, I have a book that talks about that. So we're going to read just a few pages of this book. This is I Am Enough by Grace Byers, one of my favorites. I'll try not to cry. That's why I'm only reading four pages of it, because I'm less likely that I'll cry on camera. 
Like the sun, I'm here to shine. Like the voice, I'm here to sing. Like the bird, I'm here to fly and soar high over everything. And here's the last part, the best part. I know that we don't look the same, our skin, our eyes, our hair, our frame. But that does not dictate our worth. We both have places here on earth. And in the end, we are right here to live a life of love, not fear. To help each other when it's tough. To say together, I am enough. Let us pray. Dear God, help me remember, I am enough. I don't have to be super. I can be humble. Win or lose, you love me just the same. Thank you. I love you. Amen. Friends, let's stand for the affirmation of faith, which will be on our screen, led by our Neil Balmord on our screens. Good morning. Let us join our voices together as we affirm our faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please remain standing as together we share this gospel reading. A reading comes to us from uh, Matthew. We're in the fourth chapter and we're beginning with the 23rd verse and then we're going into the fifth chapter all the way through the 12th verse. So listen for God's word. Well, let me find my starting spot. Jesus went throughout the, all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted by various diseases and pains, people possessed by demons and having ep epilepsy or, or afflicted with paralysis, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. And when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, after he sat, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
So there was a time early in my ministry when I experienced a great deal of uh, stress. It wasn't early. It was actually kind of midway in ministry. I was the executive pastor at a large church. I've told you all about the, that church previously. And it was there that I was beginning to really experience uh, the just high expectations, mostly high expectations that I had of myself. And I felt like that there were demands that were just constantly piling up. And I got to a place where I was so overwhelmed that I realized that, um, that I, I needed help, that I was experiencing a lot of mental distress. And so I met with a therapist. I um, am a person who, who always has a therapist in the wings waiting for me. <laughs> And um, the, the thing that happened was that I realized that I just had this darkness that I was experiencing. And so I began to kind of to, to own up to the depression and the expectations. I realized that the expectations were, were um, very, um, very much my own. And one of the things that, that I realized also during that time is that when I experienced darkness and emptiness... That uh, and, and I didn't know about the Enneagram in those days. I learned later I'm an Enneagram 7. And an Enneagram 7 does not like the feeling of emptiness. And so I began to fill myself with things that I thought would make me happy, that would be, that would be something that, that would help me. And ultimately what I discovered was that I was becoming more unhealthy physically and mentally during that time. So I continued with the therapist, continued working, and began to work on what was called my shadow, to, to discover what the shadow was that I was dealing with. And then it was during that time that a friend of mine, a, a, a member of the church with whom I'm still friends today, came into my office with a copy of a chapter out of a book. And she said, I know that this may be presumptuous, but I want you to read this. And it was from Thomas More's book, Care of the Soul. And it's a book that, has, that became a textbook for me. And this chapter in the book was called The Gifts of Depression. And so it was during that time that I really learned what the shadow was about. And Moore's work was teaching about how to face that shadow, how to own that shadow, how to use that to your advantage and not to your detriment. It's what Carl Jung and others call the shadow self. And so the shadow self became that which, which I needed to address. And um, it was something that I had to learn not just to address, but to embrace, to realize that I had to love all of myself and to see that God loved all of me. And it was only then that I took a dramatic turn in ministry. Let us pray. God, you call us to look honestly at who we are, at how we are called to be in this world, and what it looks like to, to be a follower of you. So we ask that you be with us in our time of worship, and we pray that the words that we share here together, the meditations of our collective heart, will be acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh God, alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we begin with Micah, uh, as Sue read Micah to us. Uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, it includes the well-known verse that, that so many of us love. It's a verse that uh, we find on bookmarks, on bumper stickers, and on caps. So... It's, uh, it, this was given to me by my daughter-in-law who knew that I was that person that needed this cap. And so, um, you know, and, and it's this verse, God has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And here's the thing. This isn't a statement. This is a question that God asks. And I want you to hear that. And before we get to the answer of this question, I think that it's important that we, uh, we talk about what's happening in the text. And Sue helped set it up very well for us because it is this courtroom scene that is unfolding. And God has said to the people, uh, stand before me. 
come and testify. And, be, and it was set in the fullness of nature that all the mountains and the foundations of the earth are our courtroom and our jury. And you will share your story. And I will, um, I will, will address my complaint to you. It says, I will contend with Israel. And so the question, the question is, oh, my people, or the statement is, oh, my people, what have I done to you? And what have I wearied you? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from slavery. I sent you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Very inclusive statement there. And then remember King Balak and the plan he devised that was carried out by Balaam. Remember how I delivered you. And now you want to come before me with burnt offerings, with rivers of oil, with pouring out yourself? That's not what this is. And what we hear is that, that Israel is wanting to put their sin out there. Not in here. They don't want to look at that. They're not looking at the shadow. They want to put it out there. And the truth of the matter is, they're not that far from who we are today. We are people who have a really hard time holding our shadows and addressing our shadows. And it's something that um, we, we realize we, we often put on people or other things out there. And one of the things that I think we have to address if we're going to talk about justice in this world is to talk about systemic sin, something that is systemic. So the reason that people don't like critical race theory, for instance, is because it talks about the systemic nature of who we are and how racism is embedded in our culture, in our government, in our churches. And it's really hard for us because what, what we find it easy to do is to put it on one person. That's the person that pulled the trigger. That's the person that set the fire. That's the person that did the evil deed. And we condemn that person because it's easier to do that than it is to talk about who we are. And that's where this goes. We're talking about systemic sin here. And we find it easy to, to scapegoat. You know what a scapegoat was? A scape, scapegoat was literally in a village. A goat was taken. And during a time of, 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 of the, this, for the penance, the giving, of, giving up of our sins, what would happen would be the people would gather and they would name all of their sins onto this goat. And then they would get sticks and rocks and they would begin to beat the goat until the goat ran from the village into the, into the woods and became a victim of natural predators out there, wounded and dead. And that was how they got rid of their sins. <laughs> they put it out there. And Micah knows that this is not what gets rid of our sin, period. That's not it. What rids us of our sin is, this, it, we, is the acknowledgement of who we are. We stand with God, we look at God, and we own who we are individually and as a people. And we see how systemic sin is corroding the very fabric of our world. And Micah says, that's just not enough, people. We absolve ourselves. We absolve our favorite leaders. Think politics and religion. You can just name whatever you want to name with that. We, um, we, we, what we don't realize is that when we don't face our shadow, when we don't own our shadow, when we don't befriend even our shadow, then our shadow is what is driving the ship. Our shadow is what is controlling our choices and our behaviors. And so then we get to the question, so what have I asked of you but these three things? Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. And that's what I'm asking you. I've asked you of nothing else of you. And the truth is, when we look at it, we say, well, it isn't that hard. <laughs> Except that it is, right? Right? 
And that's where when we get to Matthew, we realize, um, we get to look at who Jesus really is. And we realize how, it, how hard it can be to follow Jesus. So um, instead of just the Beatitudes, we backed up the reading, as you heard me read, uh, to overlap our reading from last week by a verse. And so Jesus is, uh, the, that, that we're, we're, we're picking up from the story of where Jesus told the followers to fish for people, right? And fishing for people was uh, not what we thought. If you were here last week, you heard me say that, that it was what Diana Butler Bass called hooking uh, Caesar's elite and beaching the empire that it was a dramatic thing that was happening, a radical thing. And so against this backdrop, Jesus is still doing something radical. He's going about in their synagogues, and he's teaching about the fullness of God's grace. He's teaching the good news. He's proclaiming the good news, which is that God has come to every single person and he is standing in solidarity with the poor of the, the poorest of, of the people. The people, you remember where I talked about Galilee being a forgotten, it's just an invisible group of people, peasants, nobody cares that much about, and Jesus comes and sees them. Not only does he see them, he begins to heal them and make them whole. He sees their diseases and he begins to, to, to heal them of disease. He, he practices this ministry of wholeness. And the question is, so what's wrong with what Jesus is doing? What's wrong with what Jesus is doing is that he is creating a new community. He's calling people into a new community, a new kingdom. Remember, he's proclaiming the kingdom of God that is at hand. And it's this alternative community, this alternative kingdom that does not pay any homage to the Caesars of the world. And Rome is not down with that. The Caesars of our world are not down with that kind of behavior. They do not want us in an alternative community. But Jesus says, this is your community. You live in the kingdom of God. You live in this place. So Thursday uh, the, of this week, I ha gathered uh, with our new bishop. Well, he's been our bishop for over a year, uh, but Bishop Reuben Sines is now the bishop of the North Texas and the Central Texas Annual Conferences. So he includes Dallas and all points north up toward Wichita Falls even, and then all the way down to Round Rock and pretty wide as well. And, um, and so uh, we met with him. There were over 400 clergy that met for this gathering. And it was a phenomenal day because we're in a new day in the United Methodist Church. And we have a bishop that's leading us in this new way. And um, one of the things that we discovered was that there was a place for diversity. There is a place for divergent views. Uh, we previously had a bishop that I won't name who, um, who loved to divide us who did not like divergent views, who, who considered dissent something to be stomped out, not to be in dialogue with. And so this bishop brought us together. And uh, the thing that uh, we, we realized is that the work that we've been doing in developing our alternative community and our conference in response to everything that happened in 2019, we've been working to build community to try and create this, this alternative community. And I was one of the early leaders in this, trying to get us together to say, we do not have to live this way. That Christ is calling us to something bigger. That Christ is calling us to something better than what we have. And so the bishop, he, he teaches the same thing. And it's incredible to have this leader that comes, that comes and invites us into this conversation. And uh, he's seeking uh, to, to move beyond the harm that's being caused by the people who are dis disaffiliating and, and basically sharing half-truths, untruths about who we are as United Methodists. And he's talking about not focusing on that, about focusing on Christ and where Christ is calling us in a new way forward together. That we can see one another and we can go together. 
And so uh, this was an incredible thing. And what I realized was that when we sat at these tables, not everybody looked alike, not everybody thought alike, not everybody had the same, um, same theology exactly aligned. And it was beautiful because we were united Methodist. And that was so powerful for me. And the bishop named another truth. He said that the church is acting like the culture in which we live, where the extremes are demonizing others, where we're being told, here's a line and you're either on this side or you're on that side. And if you're on this side, these people over here are nothing short of the devil alone, that that's who that is. And if you're on the other side, you think the same way back. And he said, we have got to live by this gospel of Jesus Christ that calls us to be a new creation, to be a new community, to look differently. And we are not strong only when someone else is weak. We are strong when Christ is strong and living among us. And this is the radical nature of Christ, of, of Christ, he, of, of Christ's ministry, his healing his teaching, the wholeness that he brings. And <clears throat> it comes right in the face of those who do harm to other people in order to lift themselves up. And that's something that we have to hear. And there's this challenge, you see, to assume a posture of faith. And the posture of faith, we're told, is humility, but I think it's more than that. I want you to, uh, to realize how uh, we are called to be the church in, uh, in new and powerful ways. And we are called to, uh, to be those who uh, live dependent wholly on God and God's grace, God's love alone. That's who we are. And uh, Jesus invites us, you see, into this alternative kingdom. Jesus comes and stands with the people in solidarity with the people who are most, most vulnerable. And the way for us to be in community is to stand with those who are most vulnerable. And when we stand in that community, the posture of faith is not to be bent over and cowed. It's to look at the people that are already bent over and to say, stand up. That's the posture of faith. To stand and stand together and see one another. And it still is about humility. It's still about seeing that I am not better than others. It's about seeing that, that I, along with every one of you and everyone in the world, is born of the dust, born of the dirt, humus, human, and that we breathe God's very breath in our lives, in our bodies. And so that's the message that we come claiming. And Jesus invites us to experience this kingdom, and that's what the Beatitudes are all about. You see, the word for blessed in Greek is the, the word makarioi, makarioi, which means something that's more than blessed, it's more than happy, though those are the words we use. What it means is to be enviably favored by God. Think about that. To be enviably favored by God. So we're talking about those who struggle with their faith, they're enviably favored by God. Those who are meek, they are enviably favored by God. Those who, who uh, are persecuted for living in this alternative kingdom and decline homage to Caesar are enviably favored by God. Those who follow Christ and find it really hard and when friends talk to us in ways that are, are judging us for how we believe and what we think, we are enviably favored by God. And I think it's really important that we hear that the, the Beatitudes are, are set in uh, a new way. And they're set so when we, we look at uh, the, how, how things are today, let's think about the Beatitudes in another way. See if this will be a little bit, it's hard to swallow, but see if this works. Blessed are those who are killed by senseless acts of gun violence. For they will experience God's kingdom. Blessed are the black bodies beaten and killed by law enforcement, for they shall see justice. 
Blessed are those who seek justice and are imprisoned for taking a stand. Blessed are those who suffer needless harm because of the harmful rhetoric of political and religious leaders. Micah said that the trial is underway and the people of God, my friends, are found wanting. It's really hard for us. And we are called to see that, that God brings this gift of hope and love to every single person out there. And we are called to stand in solidarity together. So the posture of faith for the blessed is to stand up and know that they are loved and they are seen in this alternative kingdom. Bold enough, we're called to be bold enough to seek justice and to do kindness we're, we will be humbled then by how powerfully God will transform us and the world when we follow Christ this way. So on Thursday, as Bishop Sines was, um, was, uh, he was, he was sharing and teaching, but he ended up preaching because it just happened. And um, there was this, uh, this one point that, uh, that he made that I thought was interesting uh, so in Hebrew scripture, rabbinic uh, stories, uh, rabbinic leadership tells us that there are 613 uh, mitzvah laws, laws that are in the Old Testament, in the, in the Torah. There are 613. And the bishop was really on a roll when he finally looked up and he said that we are told that there are 613 laws in the Old Testament. Micah got it down to three. Jesus got it down to two. Right? Love God. Love your neighbor. And friends, as easy as that is, it's the hardest thing we will do when we walk out in this world. And so when we live by the laws of, of love, then we will do justice. We will love kindness. We will walk humbly. And it'll be a little bit more than what's on a cap. Amen. Sure. Here comes another. Thank you, Barbara. Let peace, let there be peace on earth. And where does it start? With me, with you, until we're peaceful. And I want you to know my shadow self is really angry. <laughs> and I have to deal with that. And so I had to present both of both my outward appearance of a neat guy, whatever that is, to this really tick, never mind, unhappy person. <laughs> so 
I think the posture of faith is standing up and looking forward, and Jesus says, follow me. And he's moving into the future, and if we're just standing here, he's getting farther away all the time, isn't he? So we're called to follow with trust and hope as we move into the future. So Jesus, bless this offering. Bless those who give. Bless those who will receive it and undergo their ministries for kingdom work in this world. Amen. So how about it, church? This is our opportunity to respond, our opportunity to be the church that Christ is calling us to be, to seek to live in this incredibly radical way that we, that we do justice, that we love kindness, that we walk with God, that we love God and we love one another in radical, inclusive ways. So consider how Christ is calling you to that ministry as we sing together. So friends, go in peace.
Go in love. Go do justice and love kindness and be the body of Christ that you are created to be, not just in here, but out there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.